Welcome everyone. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. On behalf of Feature, USAID's Bureau and USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, and uh, I welcome you to our webinar, Crops to End Hunger, Accelerating Seed Delivery Through Sustainable Seed Systems. I'm your host and friendly neighborhood strategy and learning advisor, Zachary Bakke, with the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. I will moderate today's webinar. Before we dive into the content, let us take a moment to go over a few items to orient you on uh, the Blue Jeans webinar platform. On the right side of your screen, you will see most of your controls are located. Um, first, please do use the chat to introduce yourself, uh, share resources, and to connect and network with colleagues from around the globe. I see a number of you have already started to do that, and so uh, again, thank you and welcome. Uh, to ask questions, use the Q&A button uh, on the right. It's the lowest button with the Q and the A on it. Um, please indicate for whom your question is. If you see a question you want to hear answered, or one that is the same as yours, you can upvote it with the thumbs up uh, button. You can ask questions in the Q&A throughout the webinar. We will have, your Q we'll have our Q&A session after the presenters have spoken. In case you find the presentation too small, you can increase the size of it by using the slide bar underneath the image. Take a moment to adjust the view to suit you. Lastly, we are recording this webinar and we'll email you the recording, transcript, and additional resources once we have them ready. We will also post these resources on agrilinks.org so you can find them there. Thank you for your attention. Now onwards to our presentation and discussion for today's webinar, Props to End Hunger, Accelerating Seed Delivery Through Sustainable Seed Systems. I am pleased to introduce our, speaker, our speakers for this webinar. As of August 2019, Ian Baker leads an innovative portfolio of research and development projects designed to intensify, diversify, and strengthen the resilience of agri-food systems with potato-related technology. He is responsible for setting priorities that respond to changing country, regional, and global demands, and that contribute to the International Potato Center and CGR. CGIR uh, long-term strategic objectives and goals. Within the emerging 1CGIR structure, Ian leads an initiative design team called Seedquil. With the aim of improving the delivery of genetic gains in farmers' fields, he is also the convener of the Crops to End Hunger Seed Delivery Group. Our next, our next speaker, Dr. Nora Lapitan, is the lead for the research community of practice in the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. In this role, she oversees the Bureau's Feed the Future research portfolio. She also leads the Input Systems Division within the Center of Agriculture-Led Growth, which supports the development of innovations and technologies from agricultural, agriculture research and the creation of delivery pathways for those innovations. Nora Lapitan was a professor at Colorado State University, where she led a research program to understand the genetics of economically important traits in cereal crops. Prior to joining USAID, she served as program director at the National Science Foundation. Our next speaker, Tony Gathunga, is the global head of Seeds to Be for the Syngenta Foundation for Sustainable Agriculture, SF. SA, based in Nairobi, Kenya. Seeds to Be is SFS, SFSA, uh, seeds cream that helps farmers access quality, affordable seeds of improved varieties for the crops they need. Tony leads the strategy and long term planning of Seeds to Be in Africa and Asia, including exploring new institutional arrangements for scaling and developing new partnerships. He is also the chief of party for the USAID funded. Partnerships for Seed Technology Transfer in Africa program. Tony previously worked at Bayer, formerly Monsanto, as the Sub-Saharan African uh, Regional Lead, where he was responsible for developing and implementing Monsanto's Smallholder Strategic Growth Plan for Sub-Saharan uh, Africa for maize, seed, and crop production business. Dr. Jane uh, Inida is Nainda is head of seed research and systems development 
at Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, where she leads crop research, seed production, and seed certification and regulatory interventions. She has led teams of professional crop breeders in Africa who have developed and released 685 resilient crop varieties and supported the development of over 100 private seed companies in Africa. She has published over 40 research papers, written book chapters, blogs, and many impact stories in the media. Realizing the importance of forming strong alliances and sharing updated information and knowledge among agricultural scientists, founded key networks in crop breeding in Africa. She has also featured the effects of food shortage in the film Silent Killer, The Unfinished Campaign Against Hunger. And finally, since 2014, Dr. Barbara H. Wells has served as the Director General of the International Potato Center. Over the course of her career, Dr. Wells has worked at all levels from working directly with farmers applying science to improve incomes and productivity to senior management and holding several public and private sector board positions, including serving on the CGIR system uh, management board and chairing the food and agriculture sector of the biotechnology industry organization. Prior to joining SIP, she served as Vice President of Global Strategy at Agrivida uh, Inc., a firm that develops enzyme solutions for animal nutrition and feedstock for the production of biofuels and bioproducts. Uh, Dr. Wells has also served as President and Chief Executive Officer of Arborgen Inc., uh, Vice President in Latin America for Emergent Genetics, and Co-Managing Director of Brazilian Operations for Monsanto. And with that, I hand it over to our first speaker, uh, Ian Baker. Thank you. Thank you, Zachary, and uh, welcome to everybody. So my name is uh, um, Ian Barker. You saw my uh, uh, bio there. So what I want to do in the next few slides, so this is the formal launch of this um, Crop Strength and Hunger Seed Delivery Group white paper on seed delivery, which is entitled Accelerating Delivery Quality Seed. So what I wanted to do just in the first few minutes was just give you the context of, that sits behind this white paper, and that's just to answer the questions of, you know, like, uh, what is its context? Why now? Why did we develop this now? How did we develop this white paper, the process that we went through to develop it? And, and what's the intended audience? And what is, it, what is the expected uh, reach of this uh, white paper? And just the other th first thing I really want to do um, is just to acknowledge the, my two co-authors uh, for this study, and that's uh, Marianne Banziger and Richard Jones, who are also uh, uh, taking part in this call and going to help us with the um, Q&A session. So next slide, please. So the context briefly of this um, this study, this white paper. So this actually relates to a funder-led initiative called Crops to End Hunger. Uh, and that initiative um, exists, if you like, to, to promote public breeding, particularly within the CGIR and its uh, uh, NAS partners. Uh, and as part of the Crops to End Hunger initiative, uh, there is a platform called Excellence in Breeding. Some of you may have come across that. Uh, and that, and that's, that platform has been operating for a number of years now across the CGIR and its NAS partners, and its aim is to modernize plant breeding. And we all know what plant breeding can generate in terms of, you know, uh, climate smart traits, gender sensitive traits, uh, you know, beyond just uh, yield and productivity, nutrition, improved nutrition, etc. But of course, the, the benefits from that plant breeding reaches farmers through seeds. And it was recognized that there is a need, if you like, for investment or modernization, if you like, on the seed delivery side uh, of this equation in the point of we're not going to realize that investment in plant breeding if we don't invest in better seed delivery. Now, of course, seed delivery isn't anything new. We've been doing it for, for a very long time, but it is understood that, that, that it could be modernized and improved, made faster and smarter. And the point is there is really to accelerate the uh, delivery of genetic gain in farmers' fields and accelerate varietal turnover, accepting that many farmers today you know, are still growing varieties that maybe their grandparents were, um, were familiar with. And, and, and that accelerating genetic gain in farmers' fields, accelerating varietal turnover, those are the actual KPIs of the um, Crops to End Hunger um, initiative itself. Now, as part of this, to take this forward, um, what was called the Crops to End Hunger Delivery Group was initiated in April uh, last year by USAID, actually, at the actually by Rob Bertram, uh, and that was endorsed by the Crops to End Hunger Funder Group and the CGIR itself. And the point was there to map out, if you like, uh, 
options, future options for improving seed delivery, and particularly, and this is where the intended audience comes in, in the context and the timing of the one CGIR reform process that we'll hear a little a bit later about. And a key issue here that was, that was put to us by the funders, and I'm the convener of that group, which is the, the hat I'm wearing today, um, was particularly also to look at the comparative advantage of the one CGIR in relation to other, in this, within this going forward and planning this one CGIR process in relation to other development partners, but also critically the national program, national plant breeding programs themselves. So the next slide, please. So, so how do we go about developing this white paper? It was done over the sort of autumn of last year and the spring, finished off in the spring of, of this year. And I also first like to just acknowledge the sponsors of this study, which were Agra, Syngenta Foundation. And I'd also like to thank my actual employer, which is the International Potato Center, for making my time available, you know, to participate in, in the study. You can see here there the composition um, organizations that actually took part from Crops to End Hunger um, as part of the seed delivery group. And then we, said, we then we reached out to my co-authors, Marianne Banziger and Richard Jones. The three of us then took this, this uh, white paper study forward. Um, and we actually then reached out, it says 11 here, it's actually 13 resource uh, persons. And these were drawn from national programs, private sector, government seed regulatory agencies, uh, seed policy and social scientists, and globally. So these are from sub-Saharan Africa, from uh, Asia as well, and, and some people that at least a knowledge of, of, of Latin America. Um, and we went through a consultation process. Uh, it was based on structured and anonymous interviews with that resource group and then seeking feedback from them as we started to develop our ideas. Um, and of course, we also had available to us, you know, academic studies, uh, you know, previous st seed studies. And also we we're fortunate to, to have sight of um, uh, some seed interventions, which are in a late stage of planning, and, and that's, we thought, quite critical to make sure that we could try going forward, ensure some sort of continuity and more, more harmony and congruence amongst these planned seed interventions. Again, uh, thinking about this comparative advantage of the one CG, what the CG can do, what it can't do, for example, but then equally, what are other actors, what are development other actors best able to do, and to see if we could harmonize that uh, going forward and get some um, some congruence. Now, in that consultation process, it's interesting. The first thing I wanted to say is it's not all bad. It's something, of, as we went through that process, it's very, very clear that out there, there are some excellent examples of good practice across this seed system, seed sector space. You know, we, we find um, excellent vegetable seed companies doing wonderful extension work, you know, and agronomy work with smallholder growers. We found these great examples of these new private foundation seed companies trying to address this early generation seed bottleneck problem in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, we found, uh, we, we looked at some of the work being done, and you'll hear about it later from, from Nora and Tony, about industry good practice around stage gating methodology, um, which we think can help the public sector in, in order its, its thinking, its product advancement processes, what we call fewer, better varieties, and also monitoring of progress, and you'll, hear, you'll be hearing about that later. Equally, um, you know, just to say we have Agra on the call, you know, it became clear when talking to some of these respondents, you know, this great, the great foundation, you know, like the Agra in Sub-Saharan Africa have put in place in terms of building up the capacity of small and medium-sized seed enterprises, that came through really clearly. So it's not all bad news. Of course, there was some bad news, you know, and there are areas, for example, in talking um, to seed companies, small seed companies, about their experience, for example, in approaching the one CGIR, or the CGIR, sorry, as well as not the one CGIR, um, you, you know, in say, they're wanting to license say, material from the CGIR centers, and, and some got good responses, some didn't, you know, and it's clear, for example, that there isn't a, a coherent, you know, a, a, a strategy for things like licensing in, across the system. And of course, it won't surprise you to learn, you know, some areas like seed regulatory reform, where market liberalization still has to go, some way to go. You know, we still have, in so many cases, bureaucratic, you know, seed um, legislation around seed quality, uh, seed variety release, you know, which I think is what needs, what was the phrase we use, right siding in, in going forward. And of course, so looking at these planned seed sector interventions going forward, again, we were critically looking and trying to address what is the comparative advantage of the CGIR in relation to its national program partners going forward, and this real wish you know, to put the national programs front and center and, and to revitalize, restate this role of capacity building with the national programs who, of course, in the, in the long run, have to take this, this forward. And just lastly, we did receive some valuable feedback from uh, Aileen O'Connor of Agri Experience, which was uh, very valuable at the time. Next slide, please. 
So just lastly, who who is this? Uh, oh, by the way, there's a photograph, some good practice. That's a that's a that's a photo I remember taking. Uh, that's Ruben Otsuler, a Calero Kakamega bean breeder, and and there he is actually uh, with a private seed company in Western Kenya, uh, you know, contracting and and the the production of foundation seed, you know, through a private partner, and that seed coming back to the Calero seed unit for distribution to other small and medium-sized enterprises in in Kenya. So you see innovation around early generation seed, even for a self-pollinated crop like uh, like common bean in Kenya. So it for sure isn't all bad news. And the point is we need to build on these experiences uh, and level up around this agenda. So, so as I said before, the principal intended audience, if you like, for this white paper is the one CGIR, which, which it was, is in the process. You'll hear later going through this one CGIR reform process. And so this, the timing of this white paper was deliberate in the sense that you know, an early draft of this white paper was made available to the design teams um, working within the one CGIR, developing this area of work, and that is and remains a principal area, a principal audience for this work. But also, we're very interested in this being a resource available for the funders themselves and implementers, uh, um, in terms of you know designing a future seed initiatives and, and to gain some sort of uh, coherence across that. Um, and, and even we heard from national programs who are themselves going through, if you like, reform processes and restructuring, and they they thought this document would be very useful in in that context as well. And lastly, we hope. That this will lead a wider debate, and 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 that's what we're doing today around seed systems. Just lastly, we want to acknowledge that this, you know, the area of seed sector development is a huge area involving, you know, things like you know emergency seed relief, and inevitably this document we're looking at focuses on on trying to develop a return on investment on formal breeding, and when we do take an, uh, to see what extent formal seed systems and, and and handing over, if you like, to small commercial enterprises or other, you know, community-based seed. Um, organizations so there, there is that focus within this document but, but we absolutely do not are not saying that or, or deny or, or if you like not, not looking we, we weren't looking at the importance of community-based seed systems informal strengthening informal seed systems participatory breeding these are all critical areas and and, and we hope and actually and I certainly believe these are not mutually incompatible and they're certainly worthy of uh, uh, you know a future study so so yes this has a narrow focus but it, that's it, it just reflects the uh, the brief and, and the crops when hunger um, um, focus itself. And uh, I'd like to end there. Thanks. And I believe now handing over to Nora. As I mentioned, you know, we we, we did come across these great practices, the importance of stage gated processes, which I think is what Nora's going to go through now. Thank you, Ian. Greetings and welcome, everyone. It's great to see um, the the wonderful attendance we have today. So I'm going to um, introduce the product life cycle for seed systems. Um, if you can uh, go to the next slide, please. So in a nutshell, the product life cycle describes the stages in the development and deployment of a new crop variety. The product life cycle is also an approach to systematically manage the advancement of a research output. In this case, improve crop varieties through successive stages, applying defined gate criteria to increase the probability of later uh, stage uptake. So the product life cycle uh, starts here in stage one with variety design, which requires market segment analyses and design of product profiles that meet the demands of the market segment. And I highlighted this particular stage because of its importance in the later stages of scaling and adoption of products. So product life cycles vary with different organizations, but in general, we can think of uh, the PLC consisting of three major phases. Um, next, please. So stages one to five represent the breeding stages. Next, stages uh, six to seven to 10 represent production, marketing, and distribution of a new seed variety. And stage six is a critical stage, next please, where decisions are made on which variety should, be, should actually be produced, registered, promoted, and commercialized. So next slide, please. So what does the white paper suggest 
recommend in terms of how the CGI AR should use the life cycle uh, management approach. So the product life cycle should be considered as a management tool as well as a collaboration framework. So Ian um, earlier emphasized the importance of the national breeding programs. And so in the Crops to End Hunger, we are recommending the, the stronger, the strengthening of partnerships between CGIAR and NARS breeding programs. So in the product life cycle, the CGIAR and NARS breeding programs should work closely together, especially in product uh, PLC stages one to six. And so that includes designing product profiles to deliver varieties with characteristics informed by the demands of, of farmers and the market, which includes processors, aggregators, and consumers. Um, also to ex conduct extensive field trial trials on farmers' fields and looking ahead to the downstream PLC stages to engage seed companies early, such as participating in testing of new varieties and seed production characteristics. As a management tool, the CGIAR and um, National NARS breeding program network should consider the downstream stages and establish processes and systems to streamline the handover of improved seed for commercialization or distribution by uh, the public sector. So this includes creating transparent and simple legal frameworks for germplasm uh, licensing, communicating what varieties are available for commercialization, and including all the characteristics that are uh, that go along with those varieties, such as seed production characteristics, protocols, and risk, and how to access germplasm. So next slide, please. So how will the use of a life cycle approach make a difference? So in verti vertically integrated seed companies, all the PLC stages from research to commercialization are managed internally. And in the public sector, these different stages are managed and implemented separately by different entities. And so linkage between product development and product release and commercialization is often missing. So for example, let's just look at the crops to end hunger. They, uh, the CGI AR and um, NARS breeding programs, along with the Excellence in Breeding platform, um, operate in stages one to six, while the, the entities who commercialize or distribute the improved seed operate in stages seven to 10, and um, ideally, uh, they start in stage six as well. So the PLC shows who the actors are in the different stages and allows planning for connections that need to be made in order to successfully commercialize or distribute improved seed varieties. The PLC also highlights what the breeding program entities need to be to do to streamline the deployment of public varieties for commercialization by the private, private sector or for distribution by the public sector. So going back to the Crops to End Hunger initiative, um, the initiative identified two performance metrics, the metrics for success, include the rate of genetic gain in farmers' fields and average area-weighted age of varieties in farmers' fields. So both of these can only be achieved if improved seed varieties are deployed and commercialized beginning in stage seven. So how will the PLC help achieve these outcomes? First of all, I, I'm going to stress again that the PLC requires 
that crop varieties develop meet a demand that farmers and the market have identified, and that development of crop varieties passes stage gate criteria in order to advance to the next stage. So as a result, the products that actually reach stage seven have a greater potential to be successfully scaled up by other entities. Second, the PLC also helps in planning partnerships with downstream entities that are involved in deployment and the design of realistic approaches to deploy varieties that support viable commercial seed market evolution. So as you'll hear from uh, the next speaker, Tony, the white paper makes recommendations and inter interventions to solve identified bottlenecks in the different stages of the uh, life cycle. And it's only by co connecting breeding with seed delivery that improved crop varieties will get deployed and adopted by farmers and thereby lead to poverty and hunger reduction. Thank you. Thank you, Nora. Um, so I'll walk you through um, the scaling of variety commercialization through uh, the product life cycle as uh, outlined by Nora. So next slide. And before I get started, so I just wanted to walk you through um, what the Syngenta Foundation does and specifically our seeds to be stream. And our mission is to strengthen smallholder farming and food systems where we catalyze uh, market development and delivery of innovations. And we do that while building capacity across the public and private sectors. So we have three streams of, uh, of work. Uh, first off is the agri-services work, uh, whereby we try to solve the problem of uh, poor market linkages, infrastructure and extensions for small-scale farmers. Uh, and we do that by developing and facilitating uh, farmer aggregation through our agripreneurship um, and farmer hubs uh, to provide um, uh, services, different services to, to small-scale farmers. And uh, we also have a finance and risk uh, stream that uh, solves the issue of small so smallholders, uh, smaller farmers carrying uh, inherent risk in their in in investments and uh, also lacking access of credit. And we do so by developing and brokering uh, as well as distribution of affordable insurance products to small scale farmers. And the third one is on the seed side where I sit uh, and it's called seeds to be. And this is where we, um, uh, facilitate access of improved varieties for uh, of, 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 of uh, varieties of farmers that, uh, that that they require, and as you heard from uh, Nora, uh, there's there's the link between the R and D or the breeding side uh, and uh, and the production side that's not happening naturally. Uh, so inherently, uh, yields are remaining low, and variety, uh, varietal turnover is also remaining quite low. So here we work uh, with local producers and research. Uh, uh, institutions to identify new uh, and improve varieties of crops that farmers need. Uh, next slide. So this is the product life cycle um, unpacked, and this is kind of the view that we see and uh, that we use. Um, somewhat different from what Nora had um, had had identified had shown. And as you can see, um, the red line there is kind of the, the path that a variety follows from inception all the way to the time it actually exits the market. And we use this uh, to focus our investments in seed delivery and where we think we need to uh, uh, have interventions to facilitate access of improved varieties to the small scale farmers. So as, as, uh, as you heard from Nora, so the, the R&D side, which is on the left side and the crop marketing or the seed delivery side, that gap there is not happening naturally. It does happen naturally in uh, multinationals like where I was in Monsanto. But in the public sector, it's not happening naturally. And that's the reason why we, we play a big role in, um, in facilitating the varieties moving from um, stages one to four all the way to, uh, to 12. Our, our, our scope or our sweet spot is between stages five to eight, uh, between late development and growth, uh, where we do a lot of work in uh, on-farm testing. Uh, we do uh, product profiles generation, uh, market, market segmentation analysis, uh, facilitating licensing approaches, public sector um, uh, capacity building, as well as the private sector capacity building, uh, among others. And you can see in the gray boxes, 
really some of the work that we do. Uh, we have a, a handbook that we're developing to ensure that um, the best practices that we've learned are things that be, can be able to be used by the industry later on uh, to be able to um, facilitate uh, the varietal commercialization. You also see we have a, a visa, which is a, a capacity building program funded by the Gates Foundation, uh, where we support CGIR centers in uh, bringing in varieties uh, that are market-led and demand-led uh, into the market. And we also have PASTA, uh, USAID funded, where really the rubber meets the road in terms of technology transfer and where we do a lot of that work that I just mentioned. Our AACF Seeds for Impact is a private sector SME capacity building uh, effort because we do believe private sector is important uh, to be able to facilitate uh, varieties moving in um, uh, along the value chain uh, and of course into the hands of the small scale farmers. And of course also we do uh, monitoring beyond uh, stages eight. Next slide. So uh, unpacking the interventions, um, you know, the, the white paper has done a fantastic job. One, by using the PLC uh, to assess these interventions, and uh, there's about 14 of them, and uh, I won't mention all of them, but I'll just highlight some of the key ones um, that I, I find quite important. Um, so stages five, six, seven, and eight is really where it's been focused on between late development, testing and registration, commercial introduction, and the growth phase. So the first one there between stages five and six, uh, they mentioned a very important uh, aspect or bottleneck, one about the large number of varieties that are being released by the CGIAR. That's not a bad thing, but I think the information is not uh, readily available. And uh, you know, in, in, in some instances, some of the value propositions for those varieties are also not very um, uh, detailed so that private sector or seed companies are able to get that information. Um, also, there's the element of um, some of the challenging licensing approaches because private sector wants to invest in the varieties that are coming in from the breeding pipelines, but in some, some instances you're finding that um, the licensing approaches are very, um, probably not very clear, and we need to make sure that, uh, you know, small uh, SME uh, companies are able to clearly and articulate some of the licensing approaches so that they can be able to invest in the varieties that are coming into the pipeline. So what we need here and identified below uh, as interventions is fewer and better varieties that are market-led. Um, also, more or less simplified legal frameworks, uh, I think will make it easier for uh, the private sector to make investments in this. Uh, also important is to ensure that there's um, a scaling up of on-farm testing. I mentioned that we do uh, on-farm testing at seeds to be uh, and it's important that we uh, make sure that the varieties actually work in those agroecological zones and also meet the product profiles of what the market requires um, uh, instead of you know, developing uh, numerous varieties that not necessarily meet the market needs. Uh, second, within the commercial introduction is a very important um, uh, step there, early generation seed availability. Access to that has been a major challenge, speci specifically in Africa. Uh, and I think it's important for us to start thinking about um, how we are able to generate or develop uh, robust early generation models that are, you know, private seed companies or national breeding programs can be able to capacity, uh, capacitate themselves to be able to bring in more EGS, uh, which will then mean uh, more certified seed produ uh, production for the market. Also, starting to look at um, some of the risks inherent by the private sector when they're getting into some of these uh, uh, investments, whether it's early generation seed uh, or whether it's um, uh, assessing the demand in the market. I think we need to build a capacity to be able to, uh, to assess market demand, do forecasting, production, so that they're able to then uh, bring in more varieties to the, to the market. Uh, access to finance is a big problem uh, for SMEs uh, because they can't scale um, up their uh, activities uh, with lack of finance. So we need to start thinking about how that can be worked up. Uh, and some of the market entry approaches that seed companies take may or may not be the, the right approaches. And as I mentioned previously, we're developing this handbook to, to be able to allow um, seed companies to access, to understand the best practices and how to approach the market. So uh, interventions are very clear, uh, starting to think about uh, other elements like digitizing um, seed inspection and certification to make it really a process that is uh, fast uh, and, and we're able to then move uh, varieties along, along the chain much, much, much more efficiently. 
Uh, also starting to think about uh, pre-financing options, perhaps for early generation seed production, starting to think about de-risking some of these interventions by maybe a buyback schemes, among others, uh, and also starting to think about how fund, uh, funders or donors can invest towards uh, national breeding programs to scale up their opportunities to, um, to, to, to produce more early generation seed. Uh, finally, on the growth phase um, is where we see um, how the seed companies are invest, investing, um, starting to look at some of the challenging regulations that are out there. Um, moving seed from one country to another can be a challenge. Um, when it comes to certification or registration can be a challenge. So inherently, regulations da to some extent do um, have a major impact on how uh, a variety will grow in the market. So we need to start thinking about how we can revise some of those policies to make sure that they're more um, uh, transparent and, 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 and allow for, for, for varieties to, be, uh, to make it through the market. Also starting to think about the farmer awareness because farmers um, are visual, they need to be aware of what's coming into the pipeline. That's a challenge uh, that we need to, of course, scale that work up. Um, and of course, there's also the issue about uh, farmers' um, economics. Smallholder farmers are inherently poor, so we need to start thinking about how we can be able to uh, provide access to credit for them to be able to invest in some of these um, new varieties that are coming in through the pipeline. And um, the, within the same context, there's also challenges around uh, distrust on, uh, on seeds from the formal sector, because as we all know, there's issues of um, uh, adulterated seed, fake seeds, that we need to start thinking about how we can approach um, to make, make sure farmers you know, are, 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 are able and confident to invest in, in seeds of improved varieties. Next slide. So finally, uh, I think there's a, there's a big need to streamline this handover to commercialization. And, uh, and the white paper has done a fantastic job. I mean, they've identified six key challenges from uh, incomplete seed market liberalization, um, commercial delivery of international public goods, Product profiles that are inherent and important to be able to drive market development, um, you know, strengthening the, the private sector, uh, capacity for seed early generation seed production, a very important point, and of course uh, the regulatory approaches. So it still remains a challenge. Um, uh, the farmers are not able to get access to of, of seed of improved varieties. Uh, but I think when you look at all these challenges inherently along this product life cycle lens. Um, will be able to both diversify the range of publicly bred crop varieties uh, that are available to small-scale farmers and, and most importantly, increase varietal turnover um, to the commercial channels. And of course, seeds to be um, you know, plays a big role in this and we, we are excited to, to be a part of this and looking forward to this engagement. So I'll stop there and thank you for the opportunity uh, and hand over to Jenny Ninda at AGRA. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jane. I work with ANGRA. I'm going to speak on uh, ANGRA priorities in tackling the key challenges. Next, please. I'll start here. Uh, uh, what I'm showing here is actually the uh, components of a functional seed system. And um, uh, uh, the, the key components of the system are actually about six of them, yeah, ranging from the first one, which is breeding, and the variety release, which here you find breeders developing uh, products, uh, testing and uh, releasing varieties. Uh, the second one, um, number two, early generation seed uh, production and supply. Uh, this is what the previous speakers have talked of. of uh, it's a very uh, a great connection between breeding and uh, as the next uh, seed supply, which is the number three. You see the the third one, which is such fancy production. This is where um, uh, the the varieties are uh, commercialized and produced in large numbers by uh, private uh, seed companies. At the fourth one, if you look at the circle as it goes, it's on farmer awareness. Um, and this is where we will find our, our demonstrations and information on what products the farmers need and what is out there and available for the farmer. Uh, the fifth one uh, is uh, on markets. 
uh, encompassing linkages between uh, seed companies and uh, grow dealers and um, uh, all the issues that relate to marketing of the varieties. In the middle there is what we, which, which is a very important component, it's on a regulatory and uh, a government uh, intervention. You find the regulatory agencies and all the rules and regulations that relate to uh, seed supply. Next. So looking at uh, uh, the uh, systemic gaps that uh, are there uh, in different countries, we do recognize that we are operating in many countries, especially in Africa. And uh, all these uh, uh, components uh, are operating in different levels in different countries. So what I'm showing here is, uh, uh, for example, in all the countries that Angra is operating, we are in 11 countries and all our partners are in different countries in Africa. We are able to see gaps. What we see are different gaps in the different areas um for the, these different components hence these uh, colors that you can see here if you can see clearly inside there is like how we have been able to gauge the stages of uh, these gaps because all countries are in different levels obviously the more green it is like what you can see in kenya and um, uganda meaning that the countries are a bit more advanced in tackling the systemic gaps uh, but that does not mean that there are no gaps to identify. Uh, what you can see in other countries like Burkina Faso and um, Malawi uh, are, are indications that there are gaps, there are more gaps that needs to be uh, tackled. And relating to the white paper, you know, there are several challenges which are highlighted. And actually all these challenges which my previous speaker, Tony, has spoken about, uh, relate to all these gaps in uh, the different countries. Next. Um, this is a, a, like a deep dive of actually how do we come up with uh, these gaps and how do, are we identifying these gaps in the different countries. And what I'm showing here is that we have been able to uh, synthesize and deep, uh, 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 deeply analyze uh, uh, just to give a few uh, highlights here, if you look at uh, breeding and variety release, uh, what are the key performance or system gaps that we find in breeding and variety release? They involve uh, registration processes, um, variety development, uh, ability, you know, to facilitate a release and a handover of varieties to commercial seed producers. And uh, uh, the, the components, when you digest them, you see, you know, you can be able to see, okay, when it's red, it means that really there's more work that needs to be done. When it's green, we need to still identify the gaps which are there. And we are able to do this for all those six components. The early generation seed supply, we can do this for such fine seed production. Uh, next slide, please. We are also able to do this for awareness. For example, if you go to farmer awareness, you see the government extension systems are very weak. Um, we are not able to, uh, to, to, to get information to the farmers. So basically, this is just like a view of really the, 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 the performance and the gaps that are there in the system. Next, please. Uh, so uh, uh, in Angra, we have really seen a lot of positive progress. Uh, in terms of uh, we have worked with the uh, private sector seed delivery systems of, uh, across uh, different countries for almost 10 years now. And uh, having developed 119 private seed companies, um, we have been able to see that actually when you offer, you know, the right assistance or the right um, support, a lot of these businesses remain in operation. So far, 86 of all, I say six percent of all the seed companies we have supported are still in operation. And um, if you look at the different number of seed companies that we have supported, which is what actually I'm just showing in this graph, um, although they may be few in some countries, but what we wanted to do was just to show that this model actually works. And the kind of uh, input that we do in strengthening these companies by offering technical assistance and, and grants to them to increase their production and foundation uh, access 
um, enabling them access uh, uh, business development services. We do this using either consultants or seed experts who are uh, resident with the seed companies or who stay with them to work out what professionalism in seed business means. We have established the um, Seed Enterprise Management Institute, you all know about it at the University of Nairobi, where we are able to train the seed company personnel uh, in different ways of uh, working in the seed industry. And uh, working with our partners like the Genta Foundation, we have invented the um, grant form, which is like a repairable grant through the Seed for Impact loan facilities to these seed companies. We have done this through ESIF, IJARO, and even bladed finances. And we see that this is the kind of thing that the seed companies need to be able to grow and sustain their business. Next. Uh, so the, the key priorities yeah, to tackle this, uh, uh, the, uh, to the seed sector are, uh, we, we group them into four, which, uh, obviously, uh, has been talked around uh, by other previous speakers. Strengthening seed companies is key. Um, you find that most of uh, the homegrown uh, seed companies are, uh, are focusing on crops which are of high value, like maize, and actually even a lot of regional and multinational companies do that. But we know that farmers don't just grow maize, they grow other varieties and minimal crops. And so training these companies, giving them startup grants and loans is very important. Strengthening the capacity to produce early generation seed and implementing the workable models is something which is also key to tackle the challenges. Uh, we have found that the regulatory agencies, really most of them are weak and they need to be strengthened so that they can be able to professionally, you know, support the seed business. And the other one uh, is on awareness creation. Um, uh, most of the government extension systems being weak, they need a lot of support from the private extension model. Uh, one of the models that Angra is implementing is the VBA, Village Based Advisor model, where we are able to reduce the number of uh, farmers per extension worker. Next. And so um, uh, one of the things that uh, we are uh, going to do moving forward, uh, Angra is deploying the seed system assessment tool. And um, this tool is uh, going to systematically identify bottlenecks and identify priorities and pain areas of intervention in different countries. And so we hope that all our partners, we are going to be on board and see how we can be able to digest, you know, these constraints and be able to give the right uh, support to different countries. We will continue offering technical assistance and support seed companies linked to NAS and CGIR, support early generation seed production and support regulatory and certification. Most importantly, we will continue with the scaling up using our VBA model so that we can be able to get more farmers know about the new uh, varieties and hence adopt them. And obviously, uh, working with the CGIR and NAS, we see a big role for them as has been articulated in areas to do with variety development, testing release, and there's identifying even the target market and working together in breeder and early generations in production. Uh, finally, I want to mention that next slide, uh, that we have been able to see uh, changes in the system. One of the key changes which we are seeing in different countries is that governments are now uh, uh, routinely actually and advancing towards closing the supply and demand gaps because of the increased production through the private sector which are also playing a very key role there is a enabling environment which is helping more more robust uh, competition in seed uh, sector and a lot of regional and multinational companies are now even operating in africa which is good for the farmer actually there is increased professionalism and technical efficiency, increased capacity for seed companies because of all these services which are being offered in business development and technical assistance support. Uh, in terms of seed certification, um, a lot of countries are now moving towards higher seed quality um, because of increased accreditation. Most are acceding to international accreditation. 
e-tags where the seed is labeled so that farmer is able to prove the source and origin and a lot of institutional support as well. In the terms of seed businesses and landscape, uh, because of all these different linkages between seed companies, VBAs, and grow dealers, we are seeing a lot of vibrancy in the seed business. Next. And thank you very much for uh, listening. Over to you, Ms. Thank you very much, Jane. Um, this is Barbara. I, um, my talk, I'm trying to bring this all together, really looking at how to level of genetic innovation at scale and really looking at how the one CGIAR is looking at implementing the recommendations of this report. Slide, first slide, please. First, I'd like to express my sincere appreciation to the Crops to End Hunger funders, including USAID, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the UK, Germany, and Australia for their continued support of our breeding programs. Their support in areas like excellence in breeding and our breeding programs have been fundamental to find ourselves where we are with our partners today. This Crops to and Hunger initiative, as you have heard, is focused on delivery of quality seed through economically sustainable seed systems. And more than anything, sharing with you how we intend to implement the recommendations of this report. As was mentioned by Ian and other speakers, the timing of the release of the report could not be better, particularly as we look at the reform process that we are now going through with the one CGIAR. We are finalizing our investment portfolio of the one CG, and we will be able to incorporate these findings in the context of concrete interventions with our partners and other stakeholders. Over the last year and a half, as the world has faced the tragic consequences of COVID-19, the importance of dynamic and resilient markets has become even more evident than ever before. Achieving our goals of hunger eradication, nutrition security, equitable employment and business growth is more pronounced. And seed systems are the lifeblood, as has been mentioned, of our agri-food systems. We can develop the productive, sustainable, and resilient genetic innovations needed to build more resilient, climate smart, and more nutritious food systems, but we must get them into farmers' hands. We must also hear from the farmers, consumers, and processors what their preferences are. As the one CGIAR is evolving, we have set very challenging targets. We seek to by 2030 to end hunger and enable affordable, healthy diets for 3 billion people, lift at least 500 million rural people out of extreme poverty, close the gender gap in terms of access to economic resources, ownership control over assets and resources, drive the generation of employment opportunities for 267 million young people, and maintain the genetic diversity of seeds and cultivated plants. For this, we need the right genetics, but we also need the right approaches, capacity building, and policies. We must partner with the local stake stakeholders to achieve impact at scale. The CGIAR's portfolio will be delivered through three action areas, system transformation, resilient agri-food systems, and genetic innovation coordinating efforts that bring a set of major ambitious of decadal transformation together with the strategic offer from the 1CG. These three action areas were selected specifically to build on the firm foundation of the CG traditional strengths in genetics and farming systems with a more ambitious agenda around food, land, and water systems. Next slide, please. The rapid improvement 
of quality crop varieties is fundamental to, to supplying the food, world's food and nutrition supply and to supporting the livelihoods of millions of farmers. In a time of escalating climate uncertainty, population growth, and growing demand for healthy and diverse diets, farmers need a steady stream of new varieties that are demonstrably more productive, nutritious, resilient than those they currently grow. Both breeding and stewardship of genetic resources is vital. Prioritizing breeding investments, DGIAR will develop documented investment cases for crop geography end user combinations supported by more accurate product profiles. Market facing product profiles will also address climate change, poverty alleviation, income and business development, nutritional outcomes, and specific needs of women and youth. Our shared agenda with the NARS will include better pro product profiles, varietal development, large-scale trialing, and release processes linked to seed systems. It is this renewed focus linked to improved national capacities which will allow the CGIAR to develop to deliver impact from funders' investment in trait population and parental development. Next slide, please. Specifically regarding seed systems, we will engage in capacity development, connecting companies, small and medium enterprises, entrepreneurs, foundation seed entities, the NARS, and supporting the learning and capacity development needs to fill their roles sustainably. Public-private partnerships will support effective seed sector development for seed delivery adoption of quality agrobiodiversity by smallholder farmers and impact at scale. Next slide, please. Our regional integrated initiatives will be a primary model for research delivery based on co-identification of challenges and research focus co-designing, co-creating, and co-learning in innovation processes. Research and regional integrated initiatives will be the interdisciplinary connecting crops, livestock, fish and water, technical and institutional in innovations, and farming and food systems. Analysis of consumer behavior and food environment will feed back into the development of technological options and innovations in services, that is market intelligence, which my colleague have spoken to. And on a producer market consumer linkages will aim to strengthen the market relationships based on sustainability, inclusion, and competitiveness. The role of digital innovations will be essential to increase market efficiency and sustainable use of natural resources. Next slide, please. We will position our research agenda within the public and private partnerships, including national research and extension service organizations, small and medium private companies, advanced research institutions, and government agencies. Central to this approach will be our participation in multi-stakeholder platforms, which will provide mechanisms for shared innovation, capacity development, and generation of policy-relevant evidence. Influencing policies for us will be essential in building capacity and regulatory processes regionally and nationally for simpler variety registration seed certification, enhanced coordination mechanisms, etc. Last slide, please, or next slide, please. So with our new investment plan of this one CGIAR, we are working with partners on how we can meet these ambitious objectives. As now in my new role, as of a month ago, as Global Director of Genetic Innovations, my teams are working with partners to develop six genetic innovation initiatives. And I would like 
to take a moment to talk a little bit about the two that are most germane and relevant to the related white paper. First is the market intelligence for more equitable and impactful genetic innovation. And the second is SeedQuil, delivering genetic gains in farmer's field. Both of these Ian Barker addressed in the very beginning of uh, the dialogue that we've been holding. Our market intelligence initiative seeks to maximize the impacts of the genetic innovations investments by holistically gathering and analyzing women's and men's demands, market opportunities and feasibility of producing and scaling crop varieties in the local context. We expect to drive income, nutrition, climate, uh, resilience, gender and environmental benefits through this innovation in initiative through the integration of research on market segmentation, priority setting, product profiling, and stage gating decision making across the CGIAR coordinated breeding networks. Through the development of collaboration hubs with partners, we will develop approaches to product profile development and indicators for me measuring progress so that we can provide decision makers at all levels with evidence-based investor dashboard, market segmentation and prioritization in breeding and seed delivery. The other initiative is central, that is central to our seed systems work is SeedEqual. This initiative is delivering genetic gains in farmer's field, which seeks to accelerate varietal turnover, as Nora very well explained, with quality seed use and the realization of genetic gains in farmer's fields of 1.5% increase per year, and enhancing, as I said, the turnover rate of varieties, varieties in farmer's field. We see this happening through modernization of seed system development and delivery driven by renewed and clarified comparative advantage of the CG with respect to partners and the reduction of average varietal age and ensuring breeding innovations reach the most disadvantage. Some of the key goals revolve around increasing early generation seed production distribution tailored to local needs by 50% and seed market values up by 10% in 10 countries by 2025. As you see, we've already begun to incorporate the many recommendations of the white paper. As we move towards the full development of our investment portfolio, we will be enhancing further our engagement with partners and stakeholders. I believe that the CG, one CGIAR is shaping up to meet the challenges facing our planet and its people, helping to build fairer, more sustainable seed systems to resource poor farmers, traders, and consumers. Thank you very much. Back over to you. Zach. Excellent. Thank you very much to Barbara and all of our speakers. Uh, it was a great uh, set of presentations and a great discussion that's in the chat and in the, the Q&A. So just to let folks know that this presentation is being recorded, we will be sending out the recording and the slide deck for the presentation uh, to everyone who registered for the event. And additionally, we will be posting it onto agrilinks.org. So if you missed a part of it uh, or had a bad connection or the like, um, please check there or look for an email um, in the future so that you can access it and watch at your leisure. Um, additionally, we are going to move into the Q&A and just also to note that this webinar is part of the Ag Transformation um, theme month for AgriLinks. Um, please you know, check out AgriLinks for more uh, details on the theme month for the, the posts that go along with it and to also if you have uh, post or you know information that goes along with the theme month um, to be, please uh, post that to AgriLinks. Uh, with that, uh, I'm going to go into the Q&A. So just to note, uh, the 
presenters and co-authors for the, the white paper have done an outstanding job of going in and, you know, posting answers to your questions. So greatly appreciated for that. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is try to go to those questions that have not gotten answers um, thus far. And uh, if you have replies for um, the presenters and the answers that they've given, you can click on reply and type in one uh, there. But uh, I will start out with one from uh, Guy Farrar. Uh, how do you integrate the interactions? Uh, hold on, <laughs> gotta hold on to it. Uh, the interactions with the informal seed systems around 80% of farmers in Africa access seeds through the informal seed systems. A few of them through cooperatives. How do you, to manage improve this broader seed system, both formal and informal? That one had an answer. Uh, anyone want to expand it? Uh, sorry, I didn't see that uh, Richard Jones had answered that question. Anyone wanted to expand on that one? If not, as I said, our, our presenters and authors have done an outstanding job of answering these questions. I have very few to uh, ask. Uh, so, next unanswered question, I can see that there's no answer on this one, uh, from Serini. In the seed value chain, from TC production to basic seed, it is clear about uh, seed classes and able to monitor well about performance, but after basic seed, it is not clear which classes of seed farmers are accessing in, in the informal sector. So is it a good idea to connect formal with informal sector? Anyone want to take a stab at that question? I can attempt to answer that question. I can't see it. Can you repeat the question again? Can you read yes. it again for me? I can't see it on the chat. Sure, I can uh, read it. Uh, in the seed value chain, from TC production to basic seed, it is clear about seed classes and able to monitor well about performance. But after basic seed, it is not clear which classes of seed farmers are accessing in the informal sector. So it is, is it a good idea to connect the formal with the informal sector? Uh, yeah, okay, so what I can say about that, it's a good question, and actually it's a reality on the ground, especially when we are talking about vegetative free propagating crop. Uh, in this case, I, it, uh, let's say potato, which uh, uh, they are different, I mean, you go through different stages in this certification, and um, what I would say, uh, that's why it's important to streamline the regulatory agencies. Uh, one of the attempts, like what Angra is doing, is to have um, uh, models developed and strengthening the regulatory agencies because of certain uh, specific crops like potato. And so you find that because farmers are not able to, we are not able to, with all these different classes and without systems and uh, regulations for vegetatively propagating crops, so farmers access the seed, but the certification agency don't have the capacity to monitor and to trace the seed. And so, yeah, it's true farmers will access. You'll find all different mixes of uh, different classes of seed being produced by farmers, which cannot be traced. And so uh, another thing that we are also doing is to introduce what we call standard seed, where we can have relaxed maybe seed certification processes for some crops. Uh, and so this doesn't have to go through the stringent certification measures that we see like for hybrid maize, for example. So it's something that needs really to be addressed. I think it was uh, briefly mentioned in the white paper. And so this is something we would, uh, we, which is definitely a gap which needs to be um, addressed. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Um, there's uh, another question from uh, Kate uh, Fallenberg. Uh, if you could please detail uh, SeedSat, um, what is it and how does it work? 
Okay, so thank you very much. So um, SITSAT is an assessment tool uh, which, uh, we, which ANGRA is going to employ to be able to diagnose, diagnose uh, and assess the different bottlenecks, which I was very well describing in my presentation in all the six areas. But most importantly, this uh, tool will be uh, able, we, what we have done is we have a different um, indicators which we are going to use to gauge where each country is in the different components of the seed system. But the most important is the thing is that if this tool is going to help us know exactly where we need to concentrate and invest, and it will also be used by our governments or any stakeholder who wants to invest in SIN system. For example, if you go to a new country and you are able to diagnose what is really the, uh, the, the issue in the different uh, areas of the SIN system, then you'll make more informed decisions when you want to invest in that country. So it will also uh, be able to bring us uh, uh, to us to a costing where we are able to know what resources do we really need. So basically, let me just say for now it's a diagnostic tool and we have just piloted it in two countries. Um, actually, the piloting was done through a grant by BMGF to die and uh, right now Angra is the one which is uh, um, going to take this tool forward to different countries. So it's something that is in the process and we are working on it to see how we can now employ it in the other country. Thank you. Um, we will be able, uh, uh, there is also a, a website, uh, I don't know whether it's really open for the seed set, um, but once it's opened, uh, probably we'll be able to, uh, you can log in and also see how it works. Thank you. Thank uh, you. This question is from uh, Solomon Gelalacha. Uh, general question related to PLC. How do you envision subsistent farmers in Sub-Saharan ac Africa access the to access the highly productive quality seeds of hybrid crop varieties, given the high cost associated with royalty ownership by multinational companies? I can take that. Can you quickly repeat that? Also, because I'm trying to also find that question. Uh, yes, it's a general question related to PLC. How do you envision subsistent farmers in sub-Saharan Africa accessing the highly productive quality seeds of hybrid crop varieties, given the high cost associated with royalty ownership by multinational companies? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so ideally, First off, multinationals, uh, you'll find it very hard for them to, 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 to actually license out most of the varieties in their pipeline simply because it's driving most of their revenue. And we can't forget um, and we can't diminish the fact that the public sector also has very good varieties through the pipeline, right? And, and that's where, and that's most of the work that is being done today is to ensure that there's a lot of good quality um, varieties um, that are coming in from the breeding pipeline from the public sector, and, 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 and it's not really seeing the light of day in terms of farmers getting access to it. And that's the reason why those varieties need to be taken through this PLC to ensure that, one, uh, the private sector is able to invest in them through a licensing approach. And the licensing approach also uh, is very clear because there's element of royalties that are very clear, whether it's 2%, 2.5% back to uh, the public sector breeding pipeline so that they can reinvest it back to their breeding programs. Um, but I see that as, as, as a more positive approach. Um, I came from um, a private sector multinational, um, but we never really, um, you know, licensed out any of our, of, our, of, our, of our material. We gave it out royalty free in different aspects, uh, but I haven't seen it happening um, in any other part of the world in terms of them, um, you know, licensing it out to other, um, you know, seed companies. But public sector players are the ones that we are really focusing on. Good. Thank you, Tony. Uh, the next question comes from Ava Weltzian. 
Uh, the white paper proposes mostly the increase of supply of seed of fewer varieties. Would it not be more important to build on farmers' demands and capacities? Uh, yeah, I can comment on that when uh, Zachary. Uh, true. Uh, our experience has been um, that uh, most uh, of the seed companies, are, their business is actually driven by hybrid base or high value crops, let me put it so. But actually African, in Africa, farmers grow a wide range of crops. So as we move into formatting and uh, uh, implementing the one CGIR, I do see uh, an avenue to expand and incorporate farmers' needs and um, incorporate the different crop varieties that are grown by farmers, which routinely may not be necessarily of interest to some seed companies. So definitely, yes, the farmer demands more options. And uh, that's the only way, you know, like uh, even we are able to uh, sustain businesses like uh, the private seed inspect extension services, you know, these small businesses which are coming up, VBAs, and uh, without this kind of diversity, because when they go there to meet the farmer, they find a farmer with all different kinds of needs. And it's also good for sustainable farming as well. Yes. Um, thank you. Uh, we have a question from uh, Happy Sikalengo. Uh, Agro was supporting seed companies with capacity building through SEMIs uh, at the University of Nairobi. Currently accessing, accessing the program is expensive, especially for small companies. How is Agro supporting the capacity building nowadays? Okay, thank you. I believe that question is mine. Yes, we did um, invest and also build the Seed Enterprise Management Institute at the University of Nairobi. And ideally, our, um, our, our view uh, was to ensure professionalism in seed uh, uh, business. Um, so you can just uh, imagine, I mean, there was no infrastructure. Uh, we needed to, to build the need for this program and have a buy-in from our stakeholders. So there was, and also for the private sector to see that they need this kind of training. So, of course, we needed a lot of investment. And um, uh, one of some of the things we have done, including building the infrastructure for the training, is to encourage, you know, some of the seed companies actually have been paying for their staff. A few have started paying for their staff because they are seeing that it is uh, leading to more sustainable business when their staff are able to, operational, uh, to, to operate uh, effectively. And so it is something that we need to continue sensitizing the private sector and also our stakeholders, that actually it is a valuable program. But indeed, with all the, 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 the trainees that are going out there, all of them are in very viable seed businesses. And so I do see the concern. I mean, how do we make this sustainable? How will this uh, uh, facility continue to be supported? But we have seen some of the private seed companies actually paying for their staff. So it is, it's an ongoing work. Thank you, Jane. Um, let's see. Um, we have another question from Ava Weltzian. Uh, what type of businesses are being considered SMEs to be supported? Are farmer cooperatives an option? I can take a stab at that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I'll just take a leave from um, the program that we have right now uh, together with AGRA, which is the African Enterprise Challenge Fund um, uh, program. So SMEs, uh, especially small seed companies that are investing in um, uh, certified seed production for the most part, 
um, meet a certain criteria in terms of turnover uh, when it comes to uh, revenues. Um, so essentially, um, smaller seed companies that are also engaging in um, uh, what we call marginalized crops, you know, things like uh, cowpea, sorghum, soybean, um, because those are the ones that are kind of left off. Uh, multinationals are playing a big role in some of the bigger crops like maize, among others. So some of the smaller seed companies that are coming in, coming on to license, essentially they don't have their own breeding programs. Um, a, a company that has a breeding program is a is, is a large company. So anything that does, anybody that doesn't have a, a breeding program, looking to develop um, the market by you know producing certified seed uh, or licensing whatever is being uh, is already coming in through the pipeline is kind of what we're considering as a as an SME. Thank you, Tony. Uh, we have a question from uh, Kate uh, Fellenberg. Uh, Community-based extension workers, agro-dealers will be key to this work. Um, what are your thoughts on the CGIR, Agra, you know, seed input trade associations investing in cores of trained, monitored, equipped community-based input dealers and technical assistance support. So in essence, I guess uh, the research groups and um, some of the larger trade associations investing in, in cores of uh, input dealers and technical assistance. I can take a bit of a... Okay. That's fine. Go, Go ahead. ahead it's uh, fine. Dave. Look, maybe taking a bit of a stab at the answer complete, um, so I will lean also to Jane to to complete it. But the, this is not an uh, in, inclusive or exclusive. You know what what is a critical? Let me put it reword this. It's critical that we be as inclusive as possible. Um, our goal is to uh, be able to have impact at scale, the right feedback loops, the connections with the market to determine. You know what the processors need, what the farmers need, and then that drives the helps drive the breeding program um, and the product profiles. So, and and from a CG standpoint, we do that across many many different crops with our breeding programs. So, I would I would say that maybe not having thought through specifically um, seed associations uh, and whatnot, but there's a network of organizations that have that we have to include as stakeholders to hear their input to make sure that we have the right products coming to market. And it's not our decision, it's a decision um, including all of the stakeholders. Jane, thank you. Uh, yeah, I don't have much to add. Uh, and just to mention that yes, we do need to also empower the village, the community-based workers, who sometimes we call also village-based advisors. And this is why we have uh, to have like a training program for them, because really these are the people who have the face of the farmer. They are meeting the farmer every day. They, the farmers, are they trust them. And so a, a training program for them is really critical uh, because they are also the ones who will help us scale up new varieties that are uh, coming out of the breeding pipelines and through the seed companies. So just to add a little more from uh, what has been said. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you, Barbara and Jane. Uh, one last question as we wrap things up. Uh, so this question is coming from Sereni. Uh, Many NGOs distribute seed for free, which also can distort uh, seed businesses, even for new seed entrepreneurs who like to venture into uh, VPC seed business. How um, might we address this issue or you know, work on that issue? Any thoughts from anyone? Okay. Yes, I can comment on that as well because, uh, I mean, this is these are constraints that we face in uh, all our countries of operation, especially 
uh, because of there's a lot there's the informal scene sector is operating is very vibrant and not only that there is a lot of human i mean it's obvious in our countries because of the humanitarian crisis uh, so you find uh, these interventions which are really required but um I think this is the importance of building our private sector uh, in Africa, because unless we strengthen our private sector, uh, we, we will always have a, a sort of influx of what we will have, maybe counterfeit seed or free seed or um, uh, seed which is subsidized, or, uh, and then farmers then don't find the value of, uh, of going into new crops. So working in strengthening and diversifying the, the, the seed sector so that we are able to bring in competition and also healthy competition, I mean, uh, is very critical. And so hence the importance of uh, this so that we can also be able to get as uh, farmers new and better crop varieties. So what I, I would say is that uh, building the private sector is very, very important because it does bring uh, healthy competition and also some farmers are able to get higher quality varieties because every seed business wants to succeed, of course. So, uh, But it's a, a big reality. That's what happens. So uh, it's something that we have to work on. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to, you know, thank all of our speakers uh, and give an opportunity if any of you had any sort of last comments or wrap up before we um, end for the day. Just, just one, um, Zachary, if I can. Um, sure, yeah, please. Just, we mentioned um, in the development of the white paper, we consulted uh, with a, a group of thirteen. Uh, technical experts around the world. I just wanted to put it on record publicly. You know, my th our thanks for, for the, the three authors for the, the, the time and experience and skill they, they put to this. The whole study wouldn't have been possible without them. They're anonymous, but they know who they are. And I uh, just wanted to uh, thank them publicly for the support they gave us. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to uh, also thank uh, Marianne and Richard, uh, who did a phenomenal job in the the Q and A uh, section of uh, of Blue Jeans in answering uh, questions from participants. Uh, I was having a hard time finding questions that had gone unanswered um, because they were doing such an outstanding job with uh, going through and providing sometimes multiple answers to participants. So um, a big shout out to to them for the, all their efforts. Uh, and again, a round of applause, you know, virtually, and thanks to all of our speakers for excellent presentations today. It has been a really uh, great uh, presentation and uh, webinar. So thanks to all, uh, and have an excellent rest of your day, whether it's the start, the afternoon, or the evening. Uh, we appreciate your participation uh, and your in continued engagement with AgriLinks. Hello. Thanks very much to everyone.